Welcome to ES310 Lesson 6. Today, for the first time, we will be looking at the kinetics of particles. So in addition to the kinematics, which allowed us to look at relationships between velocity, time, position, and acceleration, we will now be using information about the acceleration to look at the forces involved in our systems. So we'll be applying Newton's second law in dynamics. In statics, if you remember, Newton's second law simply said that the sum of the forces had to equal to zero. That's no longer true when things can accelerate, and so that's what we're adding here for dynamics. More information about this topic can be found in Hibbler's dynamics text, chapter 13, the first four sections. You might also want to review drawing free body diagrams from statics. Let's start by looking at Newton's laws. His first law says that an object at rest remains at rest, and an object in motion remains in motion, unless it's acted on by an unbalanced external force. The second law, which is the law we're going to be using primarily in this class, says that when an object is exposed to an unbalanced force, it will accelerate in the direction of the resultant force, or the sum of the forces. Mathematically, this says F is equal to ma. This is the equation that in statics, in statics we had A equal to zero, so this was the equation that gave us sum of forces in the X is equal to zero, sum of forces in the Y is equal to zero. Newton's third law says that mutual forces of action and reaction between particles are equal, opposite, and collinear. This means that if I push on the wall, the wall is pushing back at me. We used this in statics when we separated free body diagrams and the forces between the two uh, bodies that we separated were equal and opposite. Newton also came up with the law of gravitational attraction, which mathematically says that the force between two particles, or two objects, is equal to g, which is a constant, times the product of the two masses divided by the distance between them squared. We'll take a little bit of a closer look at that on the next slide. One thing to note is that Newton's laws come, come from classical physics. Classical physics does not apply when things start moving at very high speeds, so approaching the speed of light, for example, or when particles are very, very small, so when you're dealing with electrons and atoms. These laws will not be useful. However, in general, most engineering happens on the macro scale, in the real world type interactions where Newton's laws do apply. So let's take a look at mass and weight. Weight is the force of gravity on an object. Okay, It's measured in Newtons or in pounds, and it's given by Newton's law. If we take a closer look here, g is a constant given by as 66.7 times 10 to the negative third. The masses are of the two objects, so let's take some object M2 and the Earth being the other object. So the mass of the Earth is 5.9742 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. And we'll look at the surface of the Earth, so we're going to look at the radius of the Earth. If we plug that in, we get 9.79982 times m2, whatever our object is. This should look familiar. This, right, is g, the acceleration of gravity. 9.81 meters per second squared if you're using SI, or 32.2 feet squared if you're using US customary. So, G is just an acceleration, so really this forced equals G M1 M2 over R squared is rewriting of F equal to MA. Units, Newtons if you're in SI, pound force if you're in US customary. Mass, on the other hand, is the measure of the resistance of a body to a change in velocity. A change in velocity being acceleration, so basically we're defining mass through this equation. 
It's also the amount of matter in an object. It's an absolute property, which means the mass of something doesn't depend on where it's at, whereas the weight of something does. So my water bottle on Earth weighs something different than it would on the moon, but its mass is the same. The units for mass are kilograms in SI or slugs in US customary. Make sure you don't use pound masses. Sometimes textbooks or engineers will use pound masses. Convert it to slug before you use F equals MA or it will not work. And one slug is equal to 32.2 pound mass. So this gives us a sense for mass and weight. We did this in statics, but it can't hurt to review. All right, so with that in the background, we now can look at this F equal to MA that we're going to use over and over and over again in this class. In statics, MA was zero. So we had some of the forces in X equal to zero, some of the forces in Y equal to zero, some of the forces in Z equal to zero. Now we could have accelerations in each of those directions. So we have some of the forces in X equal to mass times the acceleration in X and so forth. The way we go about solving these problems is first to identify an inertial reference frame. That means that our reference frame can't be accelerating. All right, we assume in general in engineering that the Earth is an inertial reference frame. Technically, that's not right because the Earth is moving in, a, in an ellipse around the sun. So it's got an acceleration because it's on a curve. But in general, we assume that the Earth is not accelerating. We ignore that acceleration for the purpose of solving these problems. But for example, you couldn't pick a reference frame that was on an accelerating train, for example. That would not work. Then we pick, place our x, y, z axes, and there's nothing special about horizontal and vertical. So long as those axes are perpendicular to each other, we can place them at any angle. And we draw a free body diagram. Remember, when we draw a free body diagram, we take all the other objects away. We're only looking at the body we're interested in. And any object we remove is replaced by a force. And since we remove the Earth, we always replace the Earth by the weight of the object. Then we identify the expected direction of our acceleration. We're going to define this as positive. This doesn't really matter if we don't know, we can just guess a direction. But just make sure you indicate your positive direction somewhere on your piece of paper so if you get a negative answer, you know what that means in terms of direction. Then we're going to apply our second law in each coordinate direction. And if we need to, we can always go back to the kinematic equations to find more information. So they might give us information about velocity we don't need information about velocity for our problem. We need acceleration information. So we may have to use our kinematics in order to find those accelerations. So let's take a look at an example. It's a pulley example. So it'll be a good review of our pulleys from the last lesson. So let's see. We're told that we're trying to figure out how, what is the mass of block A? We're told that the mass of block B, mass of block B is 5 kilograms, and we're told that it's going to move up the slope, right? So block A is going to move down, and it's going to move 0.75 meters up the slope. It's smooth, so no friction, and it's going to move that distance in 2 seconds. And it starts from rest. So what it's giving us is information about the kinematics. Right? So we're told that the initial velocity is zero. The distance is 0 0.75, which is s minus s naught. And the time is two seconds. And we can neglect the mass of the various pulleys and ropes. So we're only interested in the masses of A and B. All right, so in order to find the, ma the mass of A, let's talk about how this is working. The mass of A 
is going to create a tension in these ropes right because it's going to be pulling down it's going to create tension in that ro those ropes the tension in a rope is the same everywhere um, so the tension in the rope then is going to be pulling on B and causing it to move up the slope okay so those are that's the forces involved so then if B is accelerating A is also going to be accelerating um, and they're going to be related through those tensions. So let's start by figuring out what is the acceleration of B. Well, we're given an initial velocity, a distance, and a time. So we can look at our kinematic equations, and we have the one where S minus S naught, which we're calling D, is equal to V naught times T plus one-half AT squared. All right, so if we solve that, we, we, this is zero. We know D, we know T, so we can find A. A is equal to 0 0.375. So that's A of block B. How is A of block B related to A of block A? Since ultimately we're trying to find mass of block A. Well, that's a pulley system, right? So let's make it look at our pulley system. If this is our datum, we've got this distance, which is SB got this distance which is SA and technically that's all we've got but it looks like we have another distance right we have a distance that's from what from here to C let's look at SC and we'll see in a minute why that that's a constant right because this is on a rigid bar so SC is a constant which means it's going to disappear from our equations but let's write the length of the rope that's how we deal with pulley systems. So the length of the rope is SB, it's this section, plus all the way down to SA, or SD, I guess, but plus S, let's call it SD, and let's change this. You should all be able to see how SD and SA are the same thing since this is a rigid link. This, the length of that doesn't change. So plus SD, that's this line, and then we have two of these. So plus two, and the length of this is SD minus SC. All right, so if we take the derivatives, the length of the rope doesn't change, so that's zero. The change in distance with respect to time is the velocity B plus velocity D plus 2 velocity d and sc is a constant so it's uh, the derivative of it is a zero as well so we get that vb is equal to 3 vd and vd let's see vd is equal to va i like a better because we're talking about a the block a so this is 3 va so accelerations are another derivative so the acceleration of B is equal to 3 times the acceleration of A. If we know the acceleration of B is 0.375, then the acceleration of A is 0 0.125. All right, so now we know information about the accelerations. That should mean that we can find information about the forces. So to do that, we're going to need information, uh, free body diagrams. So... We've got two bodies that we're interested in. We've got body B, which is on a slope, and we've got body A that is uh, straight up and down. So if we draw the free body diagram of body A, we've got its weight pulling down, which is mass A times the acceleration of gravity. We don't know mass A, but that's what we're trying to find. And then we've got some tensions pulling up right so if we look let's cut let's make body a this entire piece okay then we look here how many times do we go through that rope three different times so in each of those times we cut the rope we have to replace with the rope by its tension so we've got three tensions pulling up t t and t so if we write our F equals MA, so it's what way is this going to accelerate? Well, it's going to accelerate down 
So we're going to write our force equation downwards. And this is for our body A. So we get the sum of the forces on this is 3T going up, which is negative because we define down as positive, plus MA times G going down, those are the forces, is equal to the mass times the acceleration A, which is 0.125. All right, we don't know MA and we don't know T. So we're stuck at the moment on that one. Now let's look at the other body. So the other body is at a slant. So there's our box. We've got the normal force. There is no friction force. We've got one tension, right? Because if this is our body, we have to cut that rope, but we, there's only one rope. So tension always pulls in a rope. And we have the weight, which is coming straight down. So this is MBG, that's the normal force, and we've got the tension. It's going to accelerate upwards that way, that's our acceleration. So let's write, make our axis along the direction of the acceleration. We don't have to, but it's probably the easier way to do it. So we'll have one axis this way and one axis this way. If we look at that, then tension is all along one axis. Normal force is all along the other axis, and MBG, the weight, has a part on each one. All right, so we're going to eventually write our equation going that way. Sum of forces is equal to MBAB. All right, so we need to figure out what component of MBG is along this upward slope. So, this angle here is 60 degrees. If we make this a triangle, if this is 60, then this bottom line makes 60 on the outside, which makes me 30 is on the inside, or this angle up here is 60. All right, so convince yourself of the geometry of that. Now we can write the sum of the forces along this upward slope. T is going up. MBG times, that would be the sine of 60, because it's opposite the angle we just drew, is going downwards, and that's equal to MB times AB. Well, we know AB, we know MB, we know MB, we know G, so we can find T. So T is equal to, mass B is 5, we are in SI units, so G is 9.81. Sine of 60 plus 5 times AB is 0.375. Allows us to find the tension of 44.35 newtons. So now knowing tension, we can go back to the other block. If we know tension, we know G, we can find MA. So negative 3 times, we're going to bring this down here, right? Negative 3 times 44.35 plus MA times 9.81 is equal to MA times 0.125, solve for MA is equal to 13.7 kilograms. So that's our final answer. All right, let's take another example. In this case, the acceleration is not going to be constant, which means instead of being able to use those nice simple kinematic equations where acceleration was constant, we're going to have to use our derivatives or our integrals. So we've got a two megagram car being towed by a winch, and um, that motor, this guy, is creating a tension in the rope of 100 times s plus 1. And so the car is being accelerated, because this isn't a constant, right, so that must mean that the car is being accelerated. And we want to know 
what is its speed at s equal to 10? So we start with a free body diagram of the car. There's my car. It looks like a block. We've got a normal force. We've got a weight. So that's mg. We've got a normal force. We've got a tension. And it says we can neglect rolling resistance so there's no friction. Okay. It's accelerating in this direction. So we write our Newton's second law for that direction is equal to ma. The sum of the forces, the only force acting in that direction is T, which is 100 times S plus 1 is equal to the mass, which is 2 megagrams. 2 megagrams is 2,000 kilograms. And we want our masses in kilograms. So that's 2,000 times A. So A is equal to 1 over 20 s plus 1. All right, how do we find v from a? We could take a time derivative, but there's no time in this, right? We have an s, not a t in our equation. So if you think back to our kinematic equations, there was that combined equation, right? The one that said that a ds is equal to v dv. Well, now a is this expression. V is what we're looking for. So we're going to end up taking the integral of both sides to get V out, right? So we've got the integral from 0 to the S we're interested in, which is 10, of 1 20th S plus 1 dS is equal to integral from 0 to our final V because it started from rest, so that's where the zero is coming from, of v dv. All right, if we take these integrals, the 120 comes 120th comes out, we get 1 half s squared plus s, evaluated from 0 to 10, is equal to 1 half v squared, evaluated from 0 to v, so it's just v. Plug in 10 for s, and solve, we will get 450 is equal to 1 half v squared, or v is equal to 30 meters per second. So, a couple of special situations. First of all, usually we have a whole bunch of particles or a solid object that is made up of a whole bunch of particles, right? We don't have single particles, though sometimes we can assume we have single, things act like single particles. All right, so if we can lump these particles together to create a solid body, we still have the same equation, all right? Sum of forces equals mass times acceleration, but what, the acceleration of what? If you clump a whole bunch of particles together, it could be that some of those particles aren't accelerating at the same rate as other particles. So what we use is the acceleration of the center of gravity. Thinking back to statics, we found the center of gravity for various objects, right? There was a whole big process, and we'll revisit that when we get to the point where we're doing it here. M is just the sum of the masses of all the little particles, so it's, su it's the mass of the whole body together. Okay, something else that we need, that we saw in statics that we'll have to factor into dynamics as well is friction. So if we remember friction, friction always acts to oppose the motion, right? So if an object is moving to the right, friction's going to be to the left. There's two types of friction. There's kinetic friction, which is occurring when an object moves over a rough surface. So we've got a moving uh, object, which is why it's called kinetic. And the surface is rough, so there's a friction. There's also static friction, which prevents an object from moving. So you've got static friction up until the point it moves, and then you've got kinetic friction after it starts moving. Static friction is, in the vast majority of cases, bigger than kinetic friction. Okay? So that's why you pull hard to get something to move, but once it's moving, it's easier to pull. 
That's the effect that you're feeling there. The equation for friction is the force of friction is equal to mu, where you've got a mu k or a mu s, depending on which friction you're looking at, times the normal force. So we'll be looking at an example of using friction in a second. The other thing that can create forces often are springs. So we've got elastic springs. They create a force based on how much they're stretched or compressed. So S is the change in spring length. There's nothing special about S. You could call it X. You could call it delta L, whatever you want to call it. But that's the distance that the spring is stretched or compressed. K is the spring constant for that spring, which is usually given to you. Something to notice, because of the way this is written, if you stretch a spring only a little bit, you're going to have a smaller force than if you stretch the spring a lot. That means your force isn't constant. If your force isn't constant, your acceleration is not constant either, which means you can't use the constant acceleration kinematic equations. You're going to have to use integrals or derivatives. And we'll see that in an example as well. So here's the example with the spring. So what we've got is this bobbin, or the shaft, right? The shaft is 2 kilograms. That's this dark blue part that they that um, is on the inside there. There's two different springs, and the springs are attached to the two ends, to B, the support at B, and the, two, the various ends. So we're going to push on end A, and we're going to compress this first spring and elongate the second spring. All right, so initially those springs are the same length and they're unstretched. And then we apply this force and we're going to shift this blue bobbin over um, and to the point where S is 50. All right, so this is going to become 50 here. And this side is going to come out to here and be 450. All right. So let's draw a free body diagram of the blue thing, the blue spool, after we've moved it this far. So here's our blue spool. There it is. Not a very good sketch, but it'll have to do. Okay, so if we're compressing this first spring, that means it's going to be push. We're pushing on it to compress it, so it must be pushing on the spool. So it's going to create a force going this way. I'm going to call that F1. The second spring we're elongating, right, because we're going from its initial length to something that's longer. So to elongate a spring, we have to pull on it. So it must be pulling on the spool. So that's going to be F2. And we also have F, which is the, the force we're applying. That's our 5 kilonewtons. All right, so those are the forces in the horizontal direction. There are also forces in the vertical direction. Right? There's a normal force at B that's supporting the spool so it doesn't fall, and there's the weight of the spool that's pushing down on that. I'm not going to draw those on there because we're only going to be interested in this direction, in the horizontal direction. So we need to pick a direction that's going to be positive. I'm going to say this way. I don't really know. Seems like we're moving that way. So I'm going to say to the left is going to be our positive direction. So if we write our force equation now in this direction for sum of forces equal to ma, the sum of the forces we've got F in the positive direction minus F1 minus F2 is equal to the mass, which is 2 kilograms, times the acceleration. All right, now this is a spring, so that acceleration is not a constant, right? Because F1 and F2 depend on the position, S, or X. So let's take a look then at the expressions for F1 and F2. They're both springs, so they're going to be a KX type equation. So we've got K1 is 2 kilonewtons, so we're going to write 2,000 times the amount that it is compressed. So I'm going to call that x. 
and then F2 is going to be Kx as well. The x is the same, right? This is going to be compressed. That's going to be elongated by the same amount because the length of the spool itself doesn't change. So that's going to be 3000 times x. All right, so let's take this over here. We'll plug them in. F is a constant. That's 5000 minus 2000 x minus 3000 x is equal to 2 times a. So now we have a in terms of x, um, which is what we wanted, right? We've got the acceleration in terms of the position. We can rewrite this. a then is equal to, this is 5,000 minus 5,000 divided by 2, so we've got 2,500 minus 2,500x. All right. So back to our kinematic equations, we're still going to use the a dx is equal to v dv. Notice I'm writing x's now because that's the variable I picked. In the equation it says s. It's just a position variable, right? x is a position variable too. So if we do this integral, we're going to integrate this one from unstretched to the final stretched position. What is it? at the final stretched position. So unstretched was 250 millimeters. Stretched is 50 for one, 450 for the other, right? So the one that got longer got longer by 200 millimeters. The one that got shorter got shorter by 200 millimeters, right? So X is going to equal S minus S naught. We can do the 450 one minus 250 is equal to 200. These are millimeters. I want it in meters, so that's going to be 0.2 meters. All right, so I'm going 0 to 0.2. And this integral is going from 0, starting at rest, to whatever speed we're solving for. All right, so we're going to integrate this. Integrate 2500 minus 2500x. We get 2,500, we'll pull it out, that's x, all right, the integral of a constant becomes x minus one-half x squared. That's going to be evaluated from 0 to 0 0.2 is equal to one-half v squared. Plug in 0.2 for those x's, solve for v, we're going to get a v of e equal to 30 meters per second. All right, now let's look at an example that deals with friction. So we've got a man pushing a crate. He's pushing down at an angle, a 30 degree angle, in fact. And we need to figure out um, how fast is this crate going to accelerate once it starts moving. So if you imagine doing this, the crate is heavy, you're pushing on it, you increase the force you're pushing until it starts moving, and then it's going to accelerate. Right? So we're dealing with static and kin uh, kinetic friction here. So first of all, let's draw a free body diagram. If this is our crate, we've got the force going down on the crate, we've got a normal force pushing up on the crate, the crate would move in this direction, so friction is going to go that way. So there's friction, there's the normal force. We've got the weight of the crate, mg, or 60 pounds. And that's it, right? And those are all the forces, if we include the F that's already drawn for us. So notice they give us weight, not mass. So mass is going to equal 60 divided by 32.2, just to remind us. All right, let's look at our directions. We're going to need both directions now because we know the friction is equal to mu times the normal force. So we're going to need to use, let's give, we'll call that x and this y. We're going to need the y direction to find the normal force so that we can use the friction in the x direction. So, let's write our equations. Well, some forces to the right being positive. So our friction is negative. And the guy's pushing the part that's going to the right is F times the cosine, the adjacent part, of 30. 
that's going to equal mass times the acceleration in that direction. There is no acceleration up or down, right, because it's sitting on the floor. It's not accelerating up or down. So if we say up is positive, sum of forces is equal to normal is positive, the weight is negative, and the part of F that's going down is F sine of 30, also negative. That is going to equal zero. So using that then, the normal force is equal to mg plus F sine 30. All right, so those are our Newton's second laws. That's the kinetic part of this. Now let's think about what's happening here. First, he's pushing it, he's pushing it, he's slowly increasing his force to the point right where it starts to move. That's going to happen when we overcome friction. Okay? So part one, we have to overcome friction. Static friction. Sorry, that's radian static. We're going to overcome static friction. So in that case, F is going to equal, right as we overcome it, is going to equal the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. So, and the acceleration, because we're still, at that instant, still not moving, right? The acceleration is going to equal zero. So now we can go back to our equations, and we can write, if the acceleration is zero from this first one, we get that mu n is equal to f cosine 30, right? Because the acceleration is zero, we move things over to the other side. Um, n from the other equation is mg plus f sine 30. So if we plug everything in, mu is going to be 0.6, because it's static friction we're overcoming at this point. mg is just the weight, so that's 60. f is something we don't know, but that's what we're trying to find at this point. Sine of 30 is equal to f cosine of 30. The only unknown in this equation is f, so we can solve for f, and we get that f is equal to 63.6 pounds. So he has to push with 63.6 pounds before this thing will move. Then right after it starts moving, right, so it's, we've overcome the static friction, now it's moving with the kinetic friction. Okay, and we're trying to find the acceleration. So now the friction is going to be 0.3 times n, because we're using the kinetic friction, and the acceleration is not equal to zero. In fact, that's what we're trying to solve for. So now we have mu times n, negative, plus f cosine 30 is equal to mass times acceleration. So if we plug things in, negative 0.3, that's a 3, times the weight, 60, plus F, we know, is 63.6, sine of 30, plus F, 63.6, cosine of 30, is equal to mass, which was 60, the weight over 32.2, times the acceleration. And the only unknown in that equation is the acceleration, to solve for the acceleration, we should get 14.8 feet per second squared.